Growing up as a Star Wars fan in the 1980s, we didn't have the advantage of instantly watching it the way you do now on Disney+. Plus. In fact, we didn't even have VCRs for quite a few years. So remembering all the cool scenes basically took your memory and perhaps playing it out in your backyard or playroom, which is one of the reasons the Star Wars toys have been so popular. I mean, who could forget that scene where Luke and the Tusken Raider play that epic game of bop the rabbit on the head? Or that awesome scene of Darth Vader in the Death Star conference room where he waves his arms around like he's talking, but no words come out. No, seriously, that happens. Or, of course, who can't forget that heart-melting scene where Luke confesses to Han that he likes-likes his sister. Well, the scene that has penetrated pop culture the most tends to be the Star Wars cantina, home of, well, scum and villainy from every galaxy this side of the, well butt-faced aliens, to the T-head-squared aliens, to that guy on the right there that I swear I saw in a Star Trek episode. And I think that other koala-looking thing is sitting on my daughter's bed sometimes. Well, what is it about the Star Wars cantina and all these colorful characters that has captured the imagination of multiple generations and has spawned its own original expanded universe with well, characters that weren't even seen on screen but are now associated with the cantina. Do you know that one of Chewbacca's cousins runs the joint? Okay, maybe not his cousin, but he's also a Wookiee, what can I say? Always let the Wookiees win. Well, from a toy perspective, no scene in Star Wars has generated as much plastic content as far as different characters. And that's a big reason that we're spotlighting the Star Wars cantina today. So, hey, sit back, relax, listen to some... Uh, Jizz Whale music. Yes, that's what it's called. Because today we're talking about the Star Wars Cantina. So located on the corner of Main Street and then Bantha Boulevard in downtown Mos Eisley, the Star Wars Cantina, of course, presented the classic bar scene that's been around in cinema, storytelling for, well, centuries. I mean, who doesn't go to a bar to resolve issues or to try to find a solution? Hey, sometimes the bar eats you, right? Well, with Star Wars, the cantina bar scene has sparked a lot more. We want to know everything about every one of these colorful characters. And why is that? Well, we'd never seen anything like this before. And having Hasbro, well, Kenner, and later Hasbro with the modern Star Wars toy line, transform so many of these background characters that are really blink and you miss them into plastic that you can touch, hold, manipulate, have a tactile feeling and connection with, is a huge reason the cantina is so popular. In fact, some of the very first Star Wars toys were generated from this scene and added so much to the fantasy because it brought about the concept of collecting. Now, obviously, kids are highly into the collecting play pattern, whether it's marbles, cars, or explosives they find on the roadside near that abandoned shack where Old Man Winters lives. But this play pattern was able to sort of blend over and pour over into Star Wars in a big part because of the cantina, because there was a distinct set. You could get the aliens from this scene. Darth Vader showed up everywhere. Well, I mean, you know, he wasn't on that scene where they're on Alderaan running and screaming as it explodes. But, you know, he's prominently in the movie. So is Luke and Han and R2. The cantina aliens are all not just blink and you miss them, but they're contained within one environment. So it's easy to feel like you can collect that or have some kind of ownership over it. And because of the huge variety in characters... Well, you have to remember, Star Wars was a hugely breakthrough movie. Yes, it was a small independent film that almost no one has ever heard of, but back in 1977, it was huge breakthrough entertainment. No one had seen anything like this before. If you don't believe me, just go watch Barbarella. Most sci-fi previous to Star Wars involved giant monsters, slugs, insects attacking people. Think 1950s style uh, movies. But... Once A New Hope was made, the idea of meeting up with friends for a drink in the local bar, well, it took on a whole new meaning because the bar was now populated by these monsters from the 1950s. And honestly, no one had ever seen this before. The concept of hanging out in a bar with monsters, it was as revelationary, revelationary, revolutionary, as different 
as, well, the special effects of watching the X-Wings fly around. Sure, you look at the behind-the-scenes footage, and it basically looks like an old guy with a stick, and somebody stapled a giant, like, bug monster to the wall there. Then, you know, the masks, when they sit around on a desk, basically do kind of look like one of those 1950s sci-fi movies that were looked at by Hollywood and the toy industry as, well, we're not going to merchandise that. And the hokiness, well, it did bleed over. I mean, some of the Star Wars masks were just off the ma- off the uh, shelf masks. In particular, the Wolfman and the Devil Man, or the or Labria and Lax Sivrak, for those of you keeping up with Wikipedia. These two masks, and many of the others that joined the Cantina crowd thanks to Rick Baker's editions, well, they just came from his collection of Hollywood masks that he had and the quick reshoots that were being done at Elstree Studios in England after the initial footage was done par- partially in Tunisia. This mask in particular, the uh, devil, was originally part of a pitch for a concept called I Was a Teenage Vampire back in 1970 and then got reused in Bob Burns' Hollywood Halloween series, which was trifly popular, especially the 1974 episode about the monster in your attic, and that's where the mask showed up. So, yes, if you're wondering why Satan is hanging out in the Star Wars cantina, well, he, he kind of is, because a mask from a previous movie where a devil character was needed, well, suddenly that became a filler alien who could take up screen time, and yeah, those masks never hold up, and they just don't look as cool when you see them after 40 years. Hey, what can I say? They're not exactly meant to be long-term collectibles. But the cantina has been, and it has stayed as part of pop culture and only grown as the years have gone by. So besides the fact that it was a contained environment, it was also just something so original. And anything original, well, it tends to get imitated, and we say that's flattery, but come on. I mean, sometimes even Star Trek III, the search for more Spock, who could forget that scene where uh, Leonard Nimoy is uh, gone, so... Well, the good doctor has to go find him, and what does he do? He hires a, tries, to, or at least tries to hire a space jockey to bring him to where Spock's body is, but poor Dr. McCoy is going insane with Spock's Katra. Oh my god, I'm so nerding out here. All right, I gotta back up. The point is, main character from the film tries to hire an alien dude to fly him someplace. Heard of this before? Hey, at least they didn't hire the same actor to play the alien that they did in the can. Oh, wait, no, they did. Okay, so yeah. The scene in Star Trek III, The Search for More Spock, is probably one of the clearest, uh, oh, I hate using the word ripoff, but, you know, imitation is flattery and flattery is unoriginality. Either way, all right, let's just move on because I'm not big on bashing Star Trek as I am anything. I love all things. Now, the cantina scene did evolve. I mean, Greedo started off as a bald, Q-tip-looking alien, and thanks to the work of the special effects and mask designers... Well, he got an upgrade. Most of the characters, though, that were on set were more or less humans that were given a little splash of makeup here and there. There were a few aliens in rubber masks, especially, again, Greedo, who had a significant amount of screen time. But all of the actors playing aliens on set for all of the wide shots, and you can see a good example here, like when Luke and Obi-Wan walk into the bar for the first time. Yeah, you've got that gas mask guy in the front, but for the most part, you're dealing with, you know, shabby-looking humans. All of the masks and those aliens that we know of and think of as being members of the cantina were added later. George Lucas wasn't happy, and he asked Rick Baker to come up with aliens that he could populate with inset shots. So that's like this, where you have a shot of of actors in costume that was not on the original set, and through very clerical editing, thanks to Marsha Lucas, excuse me, Marsha Lucas, George's uh, ex-wife, who was the editor of the original film, all of the aliens were edited together, looking like they were just all on set in one big, giant, happy room. But in reality, all of these colorful creatures, some of them just being heads on sticks, because you never actually saw the body, so not every part of the alien actually had to be created. And yeah, again, when you're seeing this behind-the-scene footage, it really does show off kind of the cheese factor and how this was really no different than those 1950s sci-fi movies. It just did it better. But by populating the cantina with more and more aliens, thanks to Rick Baker's work, and actually, while 
Rick Baker should get the credit for designing the masks, the actual look for the characters wasn't him at all. It was actually Ron Cobb. He was the artist who'd worked on previous sci-fi films, also went on to work on Flight of the Navigator, different uh, different sci-fi alien creatures, and was brought on to essentially flesh out the Star Wars cantina. And he is the one who's responsible for the look of so many of the Star Wars aliens we've come to love. While a lot of them weren't executed as anything more than a mask or a shirt, and some of his designs never wound up in the movie at all, which, uh, you know, more's the pity. Who wouldn't want to toy that guy? All of the characters tend to get kind of cobbled together in our brains, and we just assume they're all there. Well, except for Admiral Ackbar and Bib Fortuna at the bottom there. They were in Return of the Jedi. As toys, though, the, the cantina continues to inspire us and continues to be fodder for product after product after product, simply because there are so many characters. Sure, Jabba's sail barge and palace has the same type of feel as the cantina, but the cantina did it first. It's, you know, the Kleenex or the Xerox or, you know, the Hebrew National Hot Dog. It's got that, it had the brand name. It did it first. So while there's lots of colorful aliens in the Star Wars universe, hey, that was Star Trek guy. Well, heck, even the humans wound up getting action figures. I mean, who can have a Star Wars cantina without a bartender to get all of your aliens sloshed? Actually, those are non-alcoholic drinks, right? Because it's a kid's movie. And those are non-alcoholic lightsaber wounds to pwn to Baba's arm, right? Because it's a lightsaber movie. Well, like I said, it's a great way to feel control over a galaxy far, far away. It's a place you might want to go hang out. It's a place you might want to be. It feels friendly. Heck, there's music and singing and dancing bat creatures. Okay, he doesn't sing, but he maybe, well, he didn't dance in the movie. And we continue to dig deeper, learning more and more about these characters, not just their backstories and their canon, if you will, but the behind-the-scenes stories are just as fascinating, and there's plenty of videos out there on YouTube diving into so many of these background characters. And as we continue to build out our bar sets and buy more and more figures, it's obvious that the cantina scene really was lightning in the bottle. In the bottle? A bottle. This bottle. Well, maybe not literally that bottle. Can you actually physically do that? That would be cool, but I guess you'd be a mad scientist. Either way, Star Wars came out at the right time, at the right place, culturally. We had just finished the Vietnam War, and all of the confusion and angst America was feeling from, well, not winning a war, shall we say. We did not lose Vietnam. It was a tie. We needed a break. We needed an escape. America was honestly at one of its lowest points in the last hundred years, and well, actually, I shouldn't say that. There were a lot worse things that happened in American history than losing the Vietnam War. But the point is, in modern times, it was something that was exhausting. And the idea of hanging out at a bar with fantastic monsters was something we had never, ever, ever, ever seen in the history of cinema before. And that really was what was so breakthrough. Taking a concept from the 1950s and 1920s, the sci-fi serials like Flash Gordon, and simply updating them with better special effects and now populating a bar, a standard scene in almost any movie that has to move along a plot to Alderaan. I hope you enjoyed this video and it was a good look at why the Star Wars Cantina is so beloved, not just from a movie perspective, from a toy perspective as well. If you like this video, please do share it with others. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the comments section in the next video.